Okay, so for everybody here, um, we are going to talk about the checklist that's available on Moodle. So if you look here under course syllabus checklist and other information, you'll see the syllabus. Remember, you have a syllabus quiz to do, right? Um, and then intro to checklist, intro to site checklist. Does everybody see here? This is all the mandatory assignments that you guys will uh, have to turn in for credit, okay? Any extra credit is actually not on here. You'll, you'll see that pop up uh, throughout the semester and you'll also see some opportunities on there now. So this should really help you guys stay on track because if you notice all the due dates are in green, which means that nobody's missed anything so far. Once the due date turns red, then you have missed the opportunity to turn that thing in. Okay, so green is good. Put these dates in your planner, I would suggest, and you should be good to go. Okay, any questions about the checklist? And you can actually modify this on your end. I don't see what you put in. Well, actually, no, I do see what you put in, but um, other students don't see what you put in. And you can check this off as you go. So let's say there is an extra credit and you want to add it in, feel free to, to do that and add that in, okay? And check that off as you go. Make sure your mask is over your nose, please. All right, any questions about that? Everybody good? Nothing on chat, we're all good? Okay. I'm gonna do roll at the end because I'm gonna stop record and then I'll call names. Okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pick right back up on chapter one, okay? We're gonna pick right back up on chapter one. And here we go. So, whoops, this is the wrong slide. Hold on a second. All right, so for those of you who attended last class, which is most everybody, okay? What was the last thing that we did before we ended class? The game, right? Exactly. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna continue the game. For those of you at home, you can put your answers in the chat. For those of you who are here, you can just hollow the answer out. Okay. We're gonna go ahead and start. Somebody needs to go on mute. Who are you? I got you muted. Okay. All right. Does everybody remember the last person we talked about? Who was it? Margaret Washburn? Yes. I believe it was. All right. Margaret Foy Washburn, was that the last person we talked about? Excellent. Okay. The right side. Okay, this is better. This is better. I don't want to go too far ahead because I don't want to um, give an answer. Okay. Right here, who was the first woman in the US to receive a PhD? Does that look familiar? Is that where we were? Okay. And so why did I make the word receive in capital letters? Because women, uh, can I say it on here? Yeah, sure, go ahead, we can hear you. Uh, because women weren't really like allowed to really get it. Oh, no, no, no. You said it was one person that earned it and then it was another person that received it. Absolutely. So does everybody hear that okay? So basically, women could, uh, and thank you for joining in on that, women could earn PhDs. That's fine. We're like, yeah, sure, hon, you got it. Sure, sure, sure. Right? But they weren't awarded. They couldn't put PhD letters beside their name because they could attend classes in some cases but they actually couldn't get the degree itself, okay? And then we had this conversation where we talked about Margaret Floyd Washburn being the first woman to not only earn a PhD, but also to receive one, 
So if you see on the slides, uh, if you see on your quiz that there's a question about this, make sure you read very carefully what the wording is, okay? So Washburn was a student of Edward Titchener and she studied the mental processes of animal species, okay? That was her area of, uh, area of specialty, okay? Any questions about Washburn? Can we go to the next question in the game? Is everybody ready? Did anybody actually look at the slides going, hey, I might actually try to an uh, answer the next question? No, everybody's like, nah, I forgot what we were doing. Did you have a question or you? Oh, no. no, okay. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to pull up the, the next one. So if you're in chat, you can type. If you're on home, you can type in chat or you can holler it out. Okay. Next question. Who was the first African-American to earn and receive a PhD in psychology specifically? Francis C. Sumner. Very good. So that question, that answer, and I know some of you, we got, we got at least one person in the chat who answered that correctly. It was Francis C. Sumner, okay? Now, Francis C. Sumner was Hall student, okay? G. Stanley Hall student. He was extremely influential in the field, just by himself. Sure, he was the first African-American to, to earn a PhD, but in of himself, he was incredibly influential, okay? So, and Clark, he attended Clark University and was awarded his PhD after he earned it in 1920. And then he was not only very influential, but was also a fantastic mentor. So he mentored a student named Kenneth Bancroft Clark. Now Clark was very influential in the area of school segregation policies, okay? So his research, what that did his research was all about the negative effects of discrimination, specifically on minority populations. So he demonstrated that it was harmful to segregate schools between black and white students, that it was not helping. And so because of this research, okay, it actually swayed the US Supreme Court's decision in 1954, which ended segregation in schools. So incredibly influential in the field. Now, Clark also was the first African-American APA president. So remember, we talked about the APA, right? So Clark, who was a student of Francis Sumner, was the first African-American to lead up the organization. Again, very influential in the field, both Sumner and Clark. Clark really paving the way um, to some really amazing things. Any questions so far? Are we good about that? Okay, so let's go to our next question. Again, if you want to go and chat and holler it out. Who believed that psychology should, be, should restrict itself to studying outwardly observable behavior that could be measured and verified, okay? Who was the biggest proponent? Skinner. Skinner, very good, okay? I don't see it on chat. Sometimes it's hard to get your fingers down, right? Especially if you see one person on iPhone, that's really, really hard to, to, type, to type in. That's exactly right. It was B.F. Skinner. And we're gonna talk about a lot of behavioral behaviorists, and we're gonna talk about this perspective later on. But B.F. Skinner was one of the biggest, most influential psychologists in the field who said that all we should do is be able to actually observe behavior, and that's what psychology is and should be. So he primarily studied pigeons and rats and, and rodents. He did things like training them. So he could teach a pigeon to, to just walk in a circle. There's a really cool video of that uh, later on as we get close to it. He was really influential in trying to establish the scientific method and series of experiments. He said psychology should all be about setting up an experiment in a lab seeing what the animal does, recording that behavior, and then influencing it later on. So that's really, he didn't care about how the animal felt, right? He didn't care if it was happy or sad or hungry or whatever. As long as it pertained to what observable behavior, he could actually note on his pad and, and create a statistical analysis for, it, okay? That's when he was mostly interested. Now, B.F. Skinner was one of the biggest pioneers 
of the field of behaviorism. Okay, so behaviorism is all about observable behavior and the process of learning. So he was teaching animals to do different things and influencing what made them learn faster and what made them learn slower. And so, of course, rewarding behaviors. Anybody here ever train a dog? Okay, give them treats usually speeds up the learning process. What also speeds up the learning process? What's that? Okay, but even faster than that. Repetition, absolutely. But what even more than this? What kind of discipline? Negative reinforcement, which is separate from punishment. And we'll talk about the difference between those. Punishing really speeds up the process. Okay, it really, really does. All right. Um, is it a good thing to punish? You know, that's questionable, right? You're doing damage. But if the whole soul process of learning is taking place, rewarding and punishing are those are two major things that you can do to speed the process up. Okay. Any questions about B.F. Skinner? Are we good with him? Okay, great. And we're going to talk about some other people here soon in just a minute. Okay. All right. Next question. Everybody ready? Here we go. Did someone just sneeze? Bless you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. What physiologist contributed heavily to behaviorism by showing that a dog can be conditioned to salivate at the sound of a bell? Have love. Have love. Okay. You guys at home can still, you can still put it in if you can, if you can do it fast enough. Okay. So there's a fun, there's, I call it fun. I, I find humor in these things. There's a meme that's going around. Okay. Where it's like Pavlov doesn't ring a bell. Right. Okay. <laughs> Did it. Yeah. So again, we're going to talk about Pavlov later on when we get to learning and all that's going to make a whole lot more sense because you're going to be like, Oh, I get to do it now. Okay. So Pavlov was a Rus Russian physiologist. He was actually not even a psychologist. He was studying digestion in dogs. And he realized that every time he went around to feed them, because he was actually looking at, like he was collecting the salivation or the spit. And he realized every time he went to feed them, that the dogs would get really excited and start drooling everywhere. Anybody notice this in your dog or even cat at home? You get the food out and they're like, all right, let's go, you know? If you have a can, you open the can and they're like, come on, man, let's open this can. They do a little dance, right? So Pavlov noticed this and he was like, whoa, 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 this is really interesting here. So even though he was a physiologist, he started realizing that you could associate behaviors together. So what he did is he took the, the food and every time he fed the dog, he would ring a bell. And then after a period of time, the dog starts to learn and associate the bell with the food. You take the food away and just ring the bell. What happens to the dog? They start drooling and salivating because they're like, oh, I'm expecting food, right? Okay. He made those associations and realized that you could train animals and people, okay, based off of um, natural responses that we have, okay? It's actually the same process as if there's somebody that you're like, kind of, you kind of like, right? You're like, you're kind of into them and you smell like their perfume or cologne or something that they have. And it makes you like, ah, oh. yeah. Or like grandma, mima has got a particular, you know, perfume smell and then smelling it reminds you of happy feelings. It's actually the same process. It's classical Pavlovian conditioning. We're gonna get into that in much more detail. So let's talk. Real quick before we go on to the next one, about some other behaviorists. So we talked about Pavlov, okay, and his importance. We talked about B.F. Skinner and why he was important. So John B. Watson was another behaviorist who was interested in studying the same process that B.F. Skinner was studying, except in humans, okay? And we're gonna get into the ethics of this later, but John B. Watson, was all about understanding the fundamental principles of learning and doing it in a way where he was testing it on, in his most famous case, Baby Albert, okay? So he trained Baby Albert to be scared 
of white fuzzy creatures like rats and bunnies by pairing that animal with a scary sound. Okay, so he was able to elicit fear responses in, in humans. Okay, very interested in how we acquire behavior and how you can modify a person's environment to change how they respond to things. Okay. Should you take a baby and scare the crap out of it? Probably not super ethical, okay? But this was done way before we really did things about the ethics in, in, in psychological research. We'll get to that later. Okay, any questions about behaviorism or behaviorists? Everybody good? Everybody's good on chat? All right, let's go to the next question. Everybody ready? Who challenged structuralism and functionalism, creating a new school of thought based on studying the unconscious factors in personality and behavior. Sigmund Freud, Sigmund Freud one of the most famous psychologists, who actually wasn't even a psychologist, that was alive, right? He was actually an Austrian phys physician. We'll talk a lot about Freud later, okay? Most people, when you say psychology, they think of Sigmund Freud sitting next to a couch that's a nice long couch and you sitting and telling all of your dreams and desires. He had some interesting thoughts about people and life, okay? Very interesting. So we're gonna get into those details later, okay? But he, really paved the way for this school of thought called psychoanalysis. And today's people who study psychoanalysis are called neo-Freudians in some cases, if they're really like along his original kind of thought processes. We're going to talk a lot about him and you're going to be like, wow, did he actually write that and say that? And yeah, he did. Okay. He believed things like Little girls wanted to have sex with their fathers. And little boys wanted to have sex with their mothers. And that changed the way that I know where they behave to come to Oedipus complex. There's a lot to unpack with Freud, okay? He was very sexist and studied only a very small population of people. And he had a lot of thoughts about all sorts of things. And most of what he believed was rooted in the fact that we have unconscious desires. So Freud might say, oh, well, you actually really desire your neighbor or friend or whatever, because you have dreams about this person and anything that looks like a cylinder represents a penis. And therefore that's all you can think about. Again, Unconscious desires that you don't even know you have, he would sit and analyze it and pull that out. Okay. Now, a lot of what he also believed was that your personality really formed in the first few years of life. So your experiences during that time really changed the way that you act in terms of personality. Okay. Also believed that you had these unconscious conflicts in your psyche and that drove how you behave and how you think. And sometimes you're conscious of it and sometimes you're not. Now he, he influenced a lot of psychology later on, probably not in the best way, honestly, but again, he was very influential and had some, some interesting thoughts. So any questions about Freud for now? Because we have a whole section on personality where we talk a lot about Freud. Is everybody good? All right, next question, everybody ready? Who was a pioneer of humanistic psychology, emphasized a person's conscious experiences, unique potential for psychological growth, free will, and importance of choice in human behavior? Carl Rogers. Oh, we got an answer in there. You had a 50-50 chance, okay? It's Carl Rogers, okay? So we're going to talk about two humanistic psychologists, okay? Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow. Rogers was the answer to the question because he did do those things. He emphasized those things. He talked about um, psychology 
as a, a new wave. So at the time, we had psychoanalysis, which is all about your unconscious desires, okay? And we had behaviorism, which is all about your observable behavior. So when Carl Rogers came along, he said, where's the human in psychology? Where did it go? Let us look at this and create a new school of thought where we put the human back into psychology. And in this case, we call it humanistic psychology. If you need to step out, that's, that's completely fine. So in the case of Carl Rogers, he created a whole new school of thought by putting the human back in the driver's seat. Because when you talk about Freud and unconscious desires, you're not in control of that. When you talk about behaviorism, that's just your outwardly observable behaviors. Again, there's control there, but you're subject to your environment. Carl Rogers said, no, you are in the, you're in the driver's seat. You're responsible for your life, your direction. You know what you're capable of in reaching your absolute potential. Okay. And again, we'll go into this in much more detail later, but he was very big on choosing this perspective to be a very different choice to believe in and to think about and to study about at the time. Also, another really interesting thing is that a lot of self-help books are sort of born from this perspective. Same thing with things like positive psychology, okay? All these things are sort of born from this idea that we have this unique potential and that we can actually choose what direction we go in. Now, Abraham Maslow is also influential in this area, and especially in the theory of motivation. How many of you have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Anybody heard of this? Yeah. This is where it comes from. It's like a triangle, and it says your basic needs need to be met first. Basically, you need to be uh, fed, you need shelter, and the top of the pyramid is your absolute potential, like where you want to be in life, your dream goal. So you have to climb the pyramid and every and your basic needs to be met, your psychological needs to be met, all that before you can actually start thinking about where you want to be in life. So his theory was really emphasizing personal growth and achieving your main goals, okay? Any questions about humanistic psychology? Are we good? Okay. So we're done with the game now. So thank you all for playing. I hope that that was a little bit more enjoyable than just hearing me just talk about everybody, okay? This should also help you for your first activity, which is all about the perspectives and choosing who you want to talk about in terms of psychologists or people who influence psychology, because not all of them were psychologists, except for Freud, okay? Because a lot of people like talking about Freud, so I, I take that off the table, because you could just kind of Google that. And I want you to, to dig deeper. Okay, so let's talk about contemporary psychology. So what I mean by contemporary psychology is psychology today, okay? So when we talk about modern psychology, there are, endless things that you can do in endless different kinds of fields and you can overlap those fields. So how is it that you choose to take a particular perspective depends on what you study in undergrad, what you study in graduate school and your mentor and what your training is. So that's one big part of how you pick a perspective. And the second big part, which I know I have these flipped, they're not really numbered, okay, is what you're interested in investigating, okay? So you can investigate the brain by taking multiple perspectives. You don't have to take one particular viewpoint and say, I'm only going to study the cells and I'm only going to study this part of the brain. You can actually study any part of psychology from any of the main perspectives. So here are some of the major ones. And again, you can overlap 
in any of these based off of your viewpoint, which ones you like, which one you kind of relate to, the topic you want to study, the training that you have, and where your interest lies. So we're going to go through each one of these individually so that you can have an idea of what they do. Okay. So the first one we're going to talk about is biological perspective, which is all about the physical basis of behavior. So this would be like where neuroscience is housed. Okay. So neuroscience is looking at the brain and nervous system, how it organizes and controls behavior. And you can look at this on any level. It can be microscopic. You can take mice, for example, and then you can cut their heads off and open their brains and slice their brains in tiny little slivers and look at it in a microscope. Maybe you're interested in the connections between cells on a microscopic level, okay? So we can go that end of the spectrum all the way to what is your brain doing as a whole to influence behavior, okay? And everything in between. That's what the biological perspective is all about. So you can focus on any level from microscopic to sort of the macro level, okay? You can look at things like eating, emotion, attention, learning are all things, areas that you can look in using the biological perspective. So some of the technology that we can use, a lot of these are used on humans. PET scan, which is positron emission technology, topography. Huh. I'd be in trouble for that probably grad school. Okay. There is radioactive substances there. They actually will put radioactive contrast in you. Um, and look at how the molecules move around in your brain. Really good for diagnostic stuff. Used in experiments on, on regular, normal human healthy brains, but there, you know, there's some issues with doing it too many times for a radioactive and you have to have special permission. So if you're interested in, in metabolic processes, like how do you uh, process a hormone called cortisol, you can look at it with a PET scan. It's really cool, actually. You can track it. MRI is really great to use a huge magnet. Anybody ever have an MRI before? You don't have to raise your hand if you're not comfortable, but you, in, you can MRI any part of your brain, right? You can PET scan any part of your brain. I mean, body, okay? But I'm talking specifically about brain here. So for those of you who've been at MRI, you're in a tube, and it's like, does that sound right? Is that yeah? Okay. So when you MRI the brain, it's magnetic resonance imaging. Okay. This magnet is spinning and it's basically influencing your atoms so that they spin a certain way. And then they go back to normal and it captures the pictures. Lots of them over and over again. Okay. And then you can get a, an actual structural image of the entire brain. Slice by slice. Okay. Now it's good. Our tech is pretty good. But you can't get down to the cellular level, okay? This is very kind of big, big picture stuff, okay? And then a functional resonance, functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, that's actually looking at it as it moves. So where is the blood flow going in your brain? Because the theory is, is when you're using a particular part of your brain, the blood's going to go to that area to give it energy, okay? Because we don't have a way for our brain to store fat, okay? You might see somebody and you're like, ah, you might call them like, you got a fat head, okay? Actually, they don't, because you don't have any fat in your brain, okay? There's no storage. It's a terrible nickname for people, because it's not actually true, okay? There's no way to store energy in your brain, so it takes it as it gets it, okay? So it takes energy through oxygen and blood, and you can actually see that happening with an fMRI. You can do an analysis to track it. Um, <clears throat> that's okay. There's other things like EEG, electroencephalography, where it looks at uh, electrical activity in your brain. Okay. Lots of other ways to look at the brain on the surface without cracking the skull open. Okay. Now, there are cases where we can do that in humans, where we can actually look at the brain 
actually take a piece out or, you know, operate on it. But that's not what you would do to a fine, healthy brain. Hey, you over there, come and join my study. We're going to crack your head open, take your skull off, and just take a piece of your brain. Does that sound like fun? No, it doesn't. It's incredibly dangerous. So what do we do? We take people who are already going through surgery for some health-related thing, and we're just like, hey, just give us a second. We're just going to come in right here and poke around. And the person's like, all right, or no. Some of you might be like, uh, hell no. I'm not going to do that. If you don't poke around my brain. I'm already having surgery. Okay. Some people say yes. Those are amazing. Those studies. Okay. But they're limited. But most of what we do with humans is non-invasive. We just take a big one. You don't want to hurt anybody. Any questions? Okay, so that's the biological perspective. Psychodynamic, we already talked about that. Based off of Freud's work, all about the unconscious, okay? People who look at this uh, in early experiences, people who do this now, um, may be referred to as Neo-Freudians, although there is a whole section of Neo-Freudians right after Freud. Um, but they're really interested in the early experience and unconscious desires and processes. The behavioral uh, perspective stems from behaviorism based on Watson, Pavlov, and Skinner, all about um, looking at acquired behavior and how you can modify the environment. So how do you think that you would do that today? So looking back, thinking about behaviorism, who would use this today? Therapists, absolutely. Therapists would absolutely use a behavioral perspective. Let's say there is a um, psychological disorder that a person has, and they want to help treat it. So they would employ different learning techniques and behavioral techniques to allow for you to change your behavior. This can go as, as simple as maybe you're smoking and somebody wants to uh, help reduce that behavior to kids with autism and trying to reinforce good behaviors, right? And change those maladaptive behaviors. Maybe the child is in the middle of school on the floor screaming, not conducive to learning, okay? And you wanna change that. So um, therapists will use this technique to actually modify behaviors. It's a very incredibly helpful technique because it works, okay? We have humanistic perspective, which we talked about Maslow and Rogers, um, talking about personal growth and reaching your potential. Um, it's often emphasized among um, psychologists who work in the mental health field, because again, therapists can use this to help people achieve their potential. Maybe they're in a bad situation. Maybe they're in an abusive relationship. Well, how can I use this to achieve my potential and be on a different path, okay? Positive psychology, and we're going to talk about Peter Seligman later um, when we get to learning, but it was very influential in positive psychology, looking at optimal functioning, trying to, um, it is, in the case of disorders, look at the, uh, and this kind of sounds kind of cliche, but looking on the bright side of things and being able to navigate the world with a different perspective. A lot of self-help books are stemmed from positive psychology. It's a really helpful perspective um, to take when trying to treat certain disorders, especially. Cognitive psychology or cognitive perspective is all about memory, mental processes, understanding how people think, looking at language, problem solving. All of these things are things that you can study through the lens of a cognitive perspective. It started with this computer idea, like with memory. So you have a computer and it has like a memory system in it and it takes the information in and stores it. And then when you wanna remember that thing, you retrieve it, okay? Same process it began with, but we're kind of moving away from that simple model, but that's where it began, okay? That's where it began is understanding the mental processes as you would a piece of technology, okay? Any questions 
about humanistic, positive, or cognitive perspectives. Is everybody good? Am I going too fast, or is everybody fine with this? Is everybody good? Okay, everybody at home is good. I don't see anything in the chat. So let's talk about the cross-cultural perspective. Now, this is one that's a little, honestly, I feel embarrassing for the psychology field, that it took so long for us to realize, and by so long, I mean 1980s, but that was like, you know, 100 years prior, to realize that culture is really important. So you, what do you guys think the first sort of groups of people in psychology, okay? The first people who were psychologists studying people, what groups of people do you think they were studying? White men. White men. Because most of the research was done at the college level and women and minorities were not allowed to attend college. So a lot of our theories and the things that we know about are based on white men. And does that apply to everybody? It doesn't. Now there are cases where it does. Something's universal. It doesn't matter who you are, what color you are, where you came from, it's the same. But there are only so many of those, okay? So the important part of cross-culture perspective is saying, let's step away and look at this. Do we have diversity in our sample? Does this apply to everybody, okay? Things aren't universal. Not everything is universal. So in some cases, like social loafing, if we take people who are from like an Eastern culture, like Japan, okay, and we have them do group work, they split the group, up, group work up very differently than Americans would from a Western culture. So Americans will say, oh, there's four people in this group. What percentage of labor are you going to put in? 25%. Some people are like, zero. <laughs> we hate you, by the way. Us group members hate you, okay? But that's called social loafing. You take a percentage off because you have a partner, you have a group member. In Eastern cultures, they would take a different perspective. They would say, I'm doing 100%. All four people are doing 100%. It's a different way of viewing it, but it's culturally based. And that is important to understand that your culture isn't the reigning culture. That's ethnocentrism. It's thinking this is the only way Americans is the only way of thinking, okay? American culture, Southern culture, only way to be, okay? Different ways to, to view it. So in individualistic culture, like our culture, we value the individual. We say, you know, I'll move away from my family because this is giving me opportunity, okay? Whereas a collectivist culture, like an Eastern culture would say family is most important. Now, interestingly, there are differences even in the US. Like, for example, the South tends to value family more than the North, okay? There are pockets to changes. So you can't lump even all cultures in the same thing. Any questions? So the final perspective is the evolutionary process, or evolutionary perspective. Basically looking at function of behavior based off of evolution. So obviously this came from Darwin, trying to say, okay, well, you know what? There are some behaviors that we have that make sense to further our species. Falling in love, being around family, um, you know, having sex and making sex enjoyable is important for making babies and continuing the species. These are all functions of evolution. And we adapt as we move forward, okay, to better our survival chances. That's the idea. David Buss is a big proponent basically talked about anything that we do must be to help our species survive. That's his whole point and all of this, here we go, okay? Everything that we do must help for our survival. Any questions about this perspective? You good? Okay. Okay. So <clears throat> one of the final things I wanna talk about is the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist. So a psychologist usually gets a PhD, okay? We can talk about a clinical psychologist who's diagnosing people with disorders, trying to prevent disorders. So you get a PhD, you get a PsyD. Um, you could get a master's degree in counseling, for example, although it's limited what you can diagnose. That's more for clinic clinicians. So they go to graduate school. So they go to undergrad, just like you guys are doing, and then they do four or five years of graduate school, out of graduate school and then they get their degree. Psychiatrists or medical doctors, 
they actually get a medical degree and go to medical school. So they go to their undergrad and then they go off to medical school. And they are like an MD or a DO, um, osteopathic, if you take a different route, but it's still a medical degree. And they are going to diagnose and treat very similar to how a clinical psychologist does. And a lot of people say, oh, well, what's the difference? Can I prescribe medicine? If I were to ask you on a test, can a psychologist prescribe medicine? The general answer is no, okay? Only a medical doctor or an MD can. However, there are about three or four states that have just changed their laws recently that allow some psychologists to actually prescribe medication. But if I were to ask you on a test, the answer would be generally no. Psychologists generally don't prescribe medications. Okay. Any questions about the difference between the two? So if you want to be a psychologist, you're going to go to grad school. And you're going to get a PhD or PsyD, something like that. And if you want to be a psychiatrist, you're going to go to medical school and get an MD or a DO. Okay. Any questions about that? So the last thing I'm going to cover, these last two charts here, I want you guys to just take a look at. And I want you guys to read these on your own. What the point is here is that you can actually overlap and be multiple areas of specialty. So like you could be a developmental psychologist who also does experimental psychology, who's also a developmental psychologist because you study a particular age group. So you can dip a toe in all these different fields and do lots of different work. You're not stuck in one track, okay? There's no perspective police coming around and saying, why well, you're too much in developmental, you're supposed to be experimental. Nobody's saying that, okay? Most of the people I know actually are multiple ones of these, okay? I would consider myself a cognitive developmental, experimental, biological psychologist. <laughs> so any final questions? I'm gonna, um, Hit, I'm, I'm going to take the record off and I'm going to call roll. Okay. Any questions at home? Just let me know. If you have questions about the lecture, please send me an email. I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to end the recording. Stay, if you're on Zoom, stay for me.